Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to finish reading Journey to the River Sea by Eva Abotson, illustrated by Kevin Hawks and published by Puffin Books. We're gonna pick up where we left off on chapter three after Maya, Finn, Professor Glastonbury, and Miss Mitten have all gone down the river in the boat. Gwendolyn and Beatrice uh, are living with Lady Parsons now, and we still haven't quite heard what happened to Clovis. Chapter 23. Maya had never had any sisters or cousins, but she had them now. Her day in the Zanti village began with three girls who were closest than her age, pulling her out of sleep and down to the river for a swim. The swim did not have much to do with striking out over the water, nor with any serious washing. It was about splashing and ducking each other and pretending to have been attacked by electric eels, and afterwards it was about chasing each other through the trees and combing each other's hair and persuading Maya that she needed a bead anklet. Then it was the turn of the babies who were brought down to the edge of the stream and doused with water from the hollowed out calabash shells while they screamed at the top of their lungs. Maya had a pair of babies that were her special charge, tiny big-eyed creatures who turned into thrashing demons when she tried to make them clean. When she got back with the babies, Miss Mitten was usually at work on her English Shanty Dictionary, but today she was surrounded by a group of women begging her to do an imitation of a person with a stomachache. Stomachache, they chanted, because it was their favorite. When she needed a word for her dictionary and couldn't make the Zanti understand, Miss Mitten took to acting. They had enjoyed her horribly snapping teeth when she wanted the word for alligator, and they were impressed when she pricked herself with a needle to get the word for blood but the one that they liked best was definitely the one where she rubbed her stomach and doubled up with pain and groaned. Yet when Miss Mitten, soon after she arrived, was struck by one of her blinding migraine headaches, there had been no need for her to act. The woman found her leaning against a tree with her eyes shut and came back with a disgusting dark green brew of bitter leaves which she forced herself to drink. And in a few hours, she was herself again. The Zanti village was not the dark huddle of huts in the gloom of the forest that Maya had expected. It was in a clearing open to the sky. At night they could see the Southern Cross and stars so brightly that they seemed unreal, and by day the sun shone down on the compound where the children played and some of the animals wandered. Nearly all the children had pets. A little boy with a hurt foot had a huge bird-eating spider with a jungle vine tied around its middle, which he led around like a dog. One of the chief's nephews owned a golden tamarind, a monkey so small that it could be covered by a human hand. Tame macaws and parrots and hopos flid, flew onto people's shoulders and off again, driving Finn's dog to despair. And by the time the sun was high and everyone was wandering about eating breakfast, Professor Glastonbury appeared. The Zanti had woven palm leaf shelters for their guests, but he preferred to sleep on the Carter's boat with the Arabella moored beside him so as to watch the boats in his collection, which was growing fast. Here's a picture of Miss Mitten miming the word for stomach ache. After breakfast, the women usually went to their work, weaving hammocks or pounding manok roots into flour or making baskets. But Maya did not have to join them. She was allowed to go to the musicians. There was a man who played a tiny three-hold flute made out of the bones of a deer, and another man who had hauled out a palm trunk which made a noise like a tuba. Maya was learning to play the little flute, and the man sang for her. All the Zanti did, she begged so hard. They sang their work songs and their feasting songs because they understood that Maya needed to know about the songs, like Miss Mitten needed to know about the words, and Finn needed to know about the plants they used for healing. And it was now Maya that saw what halt the Haltman meant when she said that he, she would find the purely native music very different and not easy to write down. The songs were wild and strange and often seemed to have no tune at all, and yet the more she heard them, the more she liked them. But they wanted a fair exchange. Sing, Maya, was heard as often as stomach ache. Maya had been singing, begun by singing funny song for the children because she knew how much the Zanti liked to laugh, but it was the old folk songs that they liked best. Sad songs in the minor key in which lovers were separated, ships sank, and people wept by open graves. By midday, the Zanti were usually asleep again in their hammocks or under the trees, and Maya and Finn would wander off to cool, a cool part of the riverbank, keeping a wary look for Miss Mitten, who might suddenly decide that they should do some mental arithmetic or Latin verbs. You know, I told you what my father said 
to have you do. Seize the day, said Maya. Well, it seems to me that there's no point in doing that here. You don't have to seize it. They give you the day. Finn spent much of his time with the old chief and the men who surrounded him. Because he had spoken a few words of his auntie before he came, Finn learned quicker than the rest of them. The chief was not a fierce warrior with feathers, as Maya had expected. He was more like a headmaster. From time to time, he would come out of his hut and lecture the Zanti about what they should do, especially the women who were supposed to work harder and get up earlier to bathe. Often he came out with his arm around Finn's shoulder. He had known Yara, and he remembered her. Finn was quieter here, thought Maya, not always working out how to get to the next thing and the next, and he watched the women carefully as they prepared food or fetched water from the river or hoed the little gardens that they had made on the edge of the clearing. Mother, my mother must have done all those things, he said. I wonder if it was hard for her to leave her friends. In the afternoon, there was usually an expedition to the forest to collect berries and plants. Maya could never get over how qu quiet the Zanti were, how careful of the land. They treated every clump of trees or trickle of water as though they were old friends. They could walk barefoot over thorns and through swamps and piles of leaves, which might have easily concealed a snake, but somehow they knew it didn't. They have wise feet, the professor said, but the professor was not often able to go into the woods for an afternoon. When he first came, he had drawn a sloth on the packed sand, a terrible creature with long hair and fearsome claws. The Zanti said yes, yes, they knew of such a beast. They had their own name for it, and soon everyone was roaring frightfully and lumbering about and waving their dangerous claws. They said it lived in the ca caves in a ridge of high ground upriver, and after that the professor's life was no longer his own. By midday, every man who could be spared, and some who could not, had piled to the deck of the carter's boat with lo logs, and was waiting to, on board to show him the way. To travel on the fireboat after a lifetime of paddling canoes was the best thing that they could think of. But they did not find the giant sloth. It took them many days even to find the caves, but they found other things. Fossilized fish and strange stones and the seeds of a flower that blossomed only once in twenty years, all of which the professor stored away. Then one day, as they were exploring an outcropping of rock, they saw, caught on a jutting piece of stone, a tuft of reddish hair, and close by which seemed to be two claw marks in the hard sand. The Zanti went wild. The prof professor tried to calm them, knowing how many tests and measurements would have to be carried out still. But at that moment, he would have given anything to be with his friend Carruthers, who had died still believing in the existence of this elusive beast. And that night, when they got back to the village... There was a party. The Zanti were not warriors. They did not fight battles with other tribes, and when danger threatened them, they simply disappeared into the forest, often staying away for weeks. But when special food was needed, they could use their bows and arrows with fearful skill. And now the hunter set out and returned with two wild pigs, a brocket deer, and a pair of plump bush turkeys. The Zanti were very fond of parties. They liked everything about them. They liked painting their faces in interesting ways. They liked making ornaments to wear. They liked feasting and dancing, and they very much liked getting drunk on the beer that the woman brewed from the manok roots. Miss Mitten had first tried not to come to the parties, to keep Maya down by the boats. But the Zanti had been so surprised and hurt by this that she gave in, and now she and Maya sat on the edge of the circle of firelight and watched. Maya's sisters had implored her to smarten herself up a little bit. They bought bowls of red Eureka dye and black Janesta, and she let them paint their face, and even Miss Mitten agreed to a dab or two of red on her forehead and a cornet of toucan feathers. Now that Miss Mitten needed, not that Miss Mitten needed dressing up, as soon as there was any sign of a party, the woman feet fetched Miss Mitten's milk tooth necklace and hung it around her neck. She tried very hard to give it as a present to the tribe, but they refused to take it. It was too valuable, they said. Finn was sitting with the old chief and his brothers. It was strange, thought Maya, and man as Finn had looked, exotic. Here he looked thoughtfully into the fire, and he looked very European. Maya loved the beginning of the feast, before everyone got too drunk. The smell of roast pork mingled with the smell of the wild lilies that grew around the hut, the soft breeze fanning her hot cheeks, and the firelight, and above all else, the brilliant stars. Soon the men began to dance, and presently the woman joined him. But then came the words that Maya dreaded. Sing, Maya, called the Zanti, and her sisters came and pulled her to her feet. So she sang, and because feasting was a serious business, she sang a song that her mother had particularly loved. The, the Ash Grove, her pure, clear voice, the English words, carried across the compound and down the river, and 
My God, said Captain Pereira, aboard a gunboat of the Brazilian River Police. Listen, we found him. The girl must be prisoners suing for them. Shut down the engines. We'll take him by surprise. But don't shoot till I give the words. Maya had stopped singing. She was making her way back to Miss Mitten when she saw them. A dozen men or more with blackened faces, carrying rifles, creeping up from the river. Don't try anything. We're armed, the captain shouted. A single shot was fired over their head. Run, hissed Finn to his mother's people. With a cry that seemed to be one cry, the Xanti vanished into the forest, leaving the four Europeans staring in horror, horror at the invaders. Here's Maya singing. But it was not the Xanti who were being rounded up. Who are you, said Miss Mitten, furiously to the leader with his blackened face. What do you want? Captain Paris stared. A tall lady, a boy who spoke perfect English, an elderly gentleman, and the girl who sang. They must be the people to rescue. But the lady in feathers and human teeth? The boy with the painted face? He was shocked. Had they gone native? You're safe now, he said. We've come to take you back. Don't worry. You're safe. Finn looked at the deserted village, the flickering firelight, the feathers dropped by his friends as they fled, and then at the men with their blackened faces and their guns. We were safe, he said bitterly. We were safe with the Xanti. But now... It was Miss Mitten's corset that had set off the river. For longer than expected, it had floated down the Aragapi River. Then, when it was about to sink, it landed on a log of balsa wood and was carried into the Negro itself, where it became entangled in a fishing net. The man who found it took it to the local police, who had sent a report to the police station in the next town, where the officer in charge confirmed that it was a British corset and sent it to Colonel De Silva and Manis. With a name tape saying A. Minton was discovered inside the whalebone bodice, it was fat on the fire. Seeing Miss Mitten's waterlocked corset very much upset the colonel. He knew Miss Mitten, and he did not think that she would have removed her underclothes willingly. She must have been captured by a hostile tribe, and if she had been caught, so probably had the professor and the children they'd been pursuing. So Captain Pereira of the Brazilian River Police was called and told to pick his men and take the fastest and best armed of the boats in the patrol free fleet and look for them. The captain wasted no time. He had laced, led several message. Uh, led several missions. He had led several missions. It was him who had put down a riot of the Talapi Indians when they turned against their employers in the Mato Silver Mine. He had broken up a battle between rival drug traffickers on the Venezuelan border, and he had rescued a kidnapped mercenary from the Calis shortly before they planned to kill him. And less than six hours after he'd been sent for, Captain Pereira and 12 of his best men were streaming out of Manus at a speed which made the urchins on the waterside dig each other proudly in the ribs. But now, though his mission had been so successful, Captain Pereira was disappointed. None of the people he had rescued had thanked him. They seemed stunned rather than pleased, and the boy's wretched dog would not stop barking. There's no gratitude left in the world, he grumbled to a second in command. Anyone think that I would think that I was taking prisoners instead of freeing them. But they came aboard with him, and they even agreed to be brought back by Pereira's men. It seemed that there were urgent messages waiting for them in Manus. Maya had thought that Finn might refuse, but he came too. The dream was over. The messages when they reached Manus pleased no one. Mr. Murray had sent no less than three cables ordering that Miss Mitten was to bring Maya back to England at once. He had heard about the fire from the consul and read about Maya's flight in the newspaper, and was both alarmed and annoyed. In an envelope... Addressed to the professor was a frantic note for Finn from Clovis. Westwood, asked Maya, watching him. Yes, Clovis is in trouble. Does he say what kind of trouble? No, but he says he's desperate and I must come at once. And will you? Finn nodded. One can't run forever. If Clovis is in trouble, it's my fault. But Maya had to turn away from the misery on his face. Chapter 24 The three of them traveled back on the same boat as Maya and Minty had come out on the cardinal, with her blue funnels and snow-white hull. Maya thought that having Finn there would make it easier. At least they could all be miserable together, but it didn't. Finn had disappeared into himself. He was very quiet and stood hunched up over the rail, looking out at the gray sea. The cold surprised him. He would shiver suddenly in the wind. He had decided that Westwood was to be his fate. It's what you said in the museum, he told Miss Mitten. Come out, Finn Tavner, and be a man. I thought I could run away forever, but if Clovis is in trouble, I've got to help him. It was his time with his auntie which had changed him. They thought that everyone's life was like a river. 
you had to flow with the curtain and not struggle, which wasted breath and made you more likely to drown, and the river of life seemed to be carrying him back to Westwood. He had left his dog behind with Furo because of the quarantine. Rob would never endure six months shut up in a kennel. As soon as they knew Maya was safe, the Carter servants with old Lila had returned, offering to work unpaid, and Miss Mitten had sent them to repaint the spinach boat, which he had christened the River Queen. As for Maya, she was to go back to school. She will be safe there for a few years until she is ready to go out in the world, M Mr. Murray had written to Miss Mitten. So now Maya was collecting her memories. We mustn't remember only the good bits, she said. We must always remember the bad bits, too, so that we know it was real. But there weren't any, really any bad bits once she had escaped from the twins. The fried termites, which the Zanti had cooked for them, hadn't tasted very nice, and there had been a tame bush turkey, which woke them up at an unearthly hour with its screeching. But it was all part of it, said Maya. It belonged. Miss Mitten knew that she was going to be dismissed, and she thought that this was perfectly fair. A governess who let her charge sail up the rivers of the Amazon and live with native tribes could hardly be, expect to keep her job. But she missed the professor. Would you like to marry me? He had asked her politely before they sailed, and she thanked him and said that she did not think that she would be very good at being married. When the boat docked at Liverpool, they went their different ways. Finn was determined to go to Westwood quite alone. He had never bought a train ticket or looked at a timetable, but he seemed to know what to do and he would let no one help him. I wish he didn't look as though he were going to have his head cut off, said Maya. The moment when the children said goodbye passed quickly. Ben was taking the train to York. Maya and Minty were bound for London. The bustle of getting their luggage on and finding their seats muffled everything else. Maya had sent her love to Clovis, and it was only when the train streamed out that she realized that she might not see Finn again and heard the snap of Miss Mitten's handbag as she heard it on the day they left England and was again handed Minty's large white handkerchief to wipe her eyes. The school, as they drove up to it, was just the same. The brass plate saying the Mayfair Academy for Young Ladies, the row of desks that she could see through the window. In classroom B, Mrs. Carlyle was probably still teaching the source of the River Thames. I'll see you tomorrow, said Miss Mitten, and drove away quickly. Mr. Murray was coming to interview her in the school that following afternoon. Everyone was so welcoming and friendly, and somehow that made it worse. The girls clustered around Maya. Melanie had painted her picture of her with a boa constrictor around her neck, and they'd made a banner saying, welcome back. Some of them had read about the police boat that had been sent to find her and thought that she was a heroine. What was it like being rescued, they want to know. It was like being rescued from paradise, said Maya, but no one believed her. They listened when she tried to describe the journey in the Arabella and life with the Zanti, but they couldn't take it in. Aren't you glad to be back, they kept asking her. It must have been so scary and they told her that she had been given her old bed back and that there was a new history teacher who dyed her hair. So Maya gave up. She realized that adventures, once they were over, were things that one ha that had to stay inside one that no one else could quite understand. The headmistress, Mrs. Banks, and her sister Emily understood a little better. They were happy to take Maya back, but they thought it might not be easy for her to settle down again. You must give yourself time, she said kindly. And Maya patted the spaniel and remembered the howls of Finn's dog as he was left behind with Furo. But in the evening, when at last she had a moment alone, she slipped into the library and leaned her head against the mahogany steps she had climbed the day that she knew she was going to the Amazon. The dream she had dreamed there had been a true one. She had found a land whose riches she had never before imagined, and she had found Finn. Well, now it was over. In ten minutes, the bell would ring for them to go to the dormitories, then another bed for them to kneel and pray. And why not? How else was one supposed to run a school? Oh, Finn, said Maya, how am I going to bear it day after day? When he reached York, Finn changed into a, a very small train, which stopped after a while at Westwood Hall. Clovis had said that he would meet him there, but there was no sign of him. Finn left his bag in the ticket office and began to walk. It was a cold, dank afternoon. And however fast he walked, he could not get warm. The light was already going, or perhaps on this bleak day, it had never really come. He saw the high pile of his ancestral home from a long way off. It looked unspeakably dismal, with its useless turrets and jagged battlements. He tried to imagine living there, year in and year out, and had to clench his teeth so as not to panic. The gate, when he reached it, was closed and surmounted by jagged spikes. As he stood there, the lodge keeper came out. This is private property, he said. No loitering. You best be getting along. Finn glared at him. 
The rudeness and snob snobbishness was just what he expected from this awful place. But before he could tell the man what he thought of him, he saw Clovis hurrying down the drive. He wore a tweed suit and a cap, but around his neck was a large white bandage. Oh God, thought Finn, had they tried to cut his throat? Clovis came up to the gate and the lodgekeeper touched his cap in a humble manner. Are you going out, sir? Yes, Jarvis, said Clovis. I'm going into the village. As he came through the gate, Finn saw that the white thing around his neck was not a bandage, but a scarf, a rather bumpy one, knitted in white wool. I thought they'd cut your throat. Clovis shook his head. The scarf was a present from the middle banshee, who had taken up knitting. There's a tea place just down the road. No one goes there much on the weekday. We can be alone. The tea shop was a tiny room in the front parlor of a brick cottage. The lady who wrote it, ran it, re greeted Clovis as respectfully as the lodgekeeper had done, and asked after Sir Aubrey. Aubrey. You'd better tell me exactly what's happened, said Finn, after they'd given their order. You said you were in a mess. Well, I'll help you out, but I must know. Obviously, you haven't told him who you are, really are. You haven't confessed. But I have, said Clovis. I have, and it was awful. So then he told Finn what had happened when at last he found Sir Aubrey alone and willing to listen to him. I told him I wasn't Finn Tavener, and it was all a mistake. I was going to explain everything properly, but as soon as I said he wasn't his grandson, he made a ghastly sort of blue color and started clutching his chest, and then he crumpled up and fell on the floor. I knew his heart wasn't good, but I didn't imagine. Clovis shook his head. I was sure he was going to die and that I'd killed him. The servants came and carried him off to bed, and the doctor said he'd had some sort of shock, and I wasn't allowed to see him. Clovis picked up a cut glass ashtray and started fiddling with it. When they did let me in, he went on. He tried to sit up in bed, and then he said, You were only joking, boy, weren't you? Tell me it was a joke and that you're really my grandson. Boys like to play jokes, I know. And? Finn's voice was sharp. What did you say? I said, Yes, of course it was a joke. Of course I was Bernard's son and his grandson. I know I shouldn't have done, but if you'd seen his face. And then he began to get better quickly. But he wants to make everything legal because I don't have a birth certificate or anything. He wants to name me officially as the heir to Westwood and give me an allowance, quite a big one. And I don't know what to do. He's absolutely certain that I'm a grandson. There's some painting of some admiral who's supposed to have my nose. And Finn was leaning across the table, staring at him intently. And you don't want it. You don't want Westwood or the money or anything. Is that why you asked me to come? The lady brought her muffins and a teapot and a knitted koozie. When they were alone, Clovis said, it isn't that I don't want it. The old man's been very good to me and... Well, there are things I could do. I'd like to bring my foster mother here to cook. She's always wanted to work in a house like this, and the cook we've got is leaving. And my, your cousins are nice, the Bashers girls. You would think that you wouldn't think that she would have nice children, but she has. And I couldn't take it from you for the rest of your life, for always. How could I live in a great house and take the money that's really yours when you live in a wooden hut? I mean, now that you've seen it, surely. He broke off. Finn was looking very odd, different. He reached for Clovis's hand. Clovis, do you swear you don't mind staying here as master of Westwood? Do you absolutely swear it? I swear it. Finn, as he walked back with his friend to the station, seemed to be made of something quite different. Not muscle and bone, but feathers and air and lightness. He did not actually intend to fly because that would have been showing off, but he felt that he could have done it if he'd wanted to. You'll never know what you've done for me, he said as they reached the level, the gates of the level crossing. If there's anything you want, Clovis grinned. Can I have Maya when she's grown up? Finn's smile vanished in an instance. No, he said. Oh, well. Maya would probably want to go off adventuring again one day, thought Clovis, and that wouldn't suit him. He'd settle for one of the Bashers banshees. There was plenty of time to decide which one. At two o'clock, Maya saw Mr. Murray's motor stop outside of the school. Five minutes later, Miss Mitten arrived, walking across the square. The interview took place in Mrs. Banks' private sitting room. While Maya waited in the hall, and as soon as she saw Mr. Murray's face, Miss Mitten knew that there was no hope. She would not be allowed to look after Maya during the holidays. She was in complete disgrace. Miss Mitten had spent the night with her sister and bought another corset because the good times were gone. She sat up very straight, and before Mr. Murray could begin, she opened her purse and took out ten sovereigns. This is Maya's money, she said. We sold the things that we had collected on the journey, and since there were four of us, it seemed proper to divide everything we earned by four. Mr. Murray looked at the heap of coins in surprise. And I have, of course, kept a list of expenses. Anything I bought for Maya out of her allowances, I have written it down here. 
Yes, yes, Mr. Murray, who had no doubts about Miss Mitten's honesty. It was her sanity that he wasn't so sure about. He cleared his throat. I have to tell you, before this escapade, I was considering making you joint guardian with me of Maya. I'm getting old, and a woman would be able to help her with problems she may soon meet. But now I'm afraid that I will have to dismiss you and arrange for Maya to spend her holidays at school. Miss Mitten bowed her, her head. Yes, she said. I expected that. Mr. Murray pushed back his chair. Miss Minton, what on earth made you let a young girl travel up the Amazon and spend weeks living with savages? What made you do it? The British Consul thinks that you must have been drugged. Perhaps, perhaps we were drugged. Not by the things that the Zanti smoked. None of us touched them, but by peace, by happiness, by a different sense of time. I don't think you have explained why you let my... Miss Minton interrupted him. I will explain. At least I will try to. You see, I have looked after some truly dreadful children in my time, and it was easy to not get fond of them. After all, a governess is not a mother. But Maya, well, I'm afraid I have grown to love her. That means I begin to think of what I would do if she were my child. And you would let her, began Mr. Murray, but Miss Mitten stalked him. I would let her have adventures. I would let her choose her path. It would be hard. It was hard. But I would do it. Oh, not completely, of course. Some things have to go on. Cleaning one's teeth, arithmetic. But Maya fell in love with the Amazon. It happens. The place is for her and the people. Of course, there is some danger, but there is danger everywhere. Two years ago, in this school, there was an outbreak of typhus, and three girls died. Children are knocked down and killed by horses every week here on the streets. She broke off, gathering her thoughts. When she was traveling and exploring... And finding her songs, Maya wasn't just happy. She was herself. I think something broke in Maya when her parents died. And uh, out there, it was healed. Perhaps I'm mad, and the professor too, but I think children must lead big lives. If it is in them to do so, and it is in Maya. The old lawyer was silent, rolling his silver pencil over and over between his fingers. You would take her back to Brazil? Yes, to live along, among savages. No, to explore and discover and look for giant sloths and new melodies and flowers that only blossom once every 20 years. Not to find them necessarily, but to look. She broke off remembering what they had planned, the four of them, as they sailed up the Aragapi, to build a proper house of rest near the Carter's old bungalow and live there in the rainy season, studying hard so that if Maya wanted to go to music college later or Finn to train as a doctor, they would be prepared and in the dry weather to set off and explore. Mr. Murray had risen to his feet. He walked over to the window and stood with his back to her, looking out over the square. It's impossible. It's madness. There was a long pause. Or is it? The old man said. Maya had been sitting absolutely still on a chair in the hall, waiting. Now she heard a loud peal on the street bell and turned to see a dark, wild-haired boy running up the steps. Taking no notice of the flustered maid, he came up to Maya. I'm going home, Maya, shouted Finn. I'm going home. Upstairs, a door opened, and Miss Mitten came slowly down the stairs, dabbing her eyes. Then she drew herself up to her full height. We are all going home, she said. And that's the end of Journey to the River Sea by Eva Abotson, illustrated by Kevin Hawks and published by Puffin Books. Once again, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.